Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast, and we're coming to you from Vancouver at the Society of Nuclear Medicine meeting. And we're going to have a bit of a group discussion this time um, about uh, dissymmetry and 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 how how that's important. And it's very important. In fact, um, we've done a number of podcasts from this meeting about theranostics. Um, and um, theranostics has been a key part of uh, uh, the podcast and nuclear medicine for a long time now. It was really the first thing that started nuclear medicine back in the 1940s. And, um, and Theranostics has, uh, in many cases, really given the reason for doing the imaging, right? Um, it's, it's the key part of what we're doing now, and it's, and it's, what, it, what, it's what makes uh, nuclear medicine especially important. Um, but it involves a whole lot of extra skills, I think, um, above and beyond just reading pictures. And uh, perhaps we'll have a bit of a discussion about that. Let's start by, let, let's uh, go around the clock and just, uh, can everybody just tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from? Sure. I'm uh, Dr. Michael Morris, a diagnostic radiology and nuclear medicine physician from Maryland in the United States. So I'm Dr. Carlos Uribe, I'm a medical imaging physicist here in Vancouver, I work for BC Cancer. I'm Dr. Bob Xavary, uh, oncoradiologist and nuclear medicine physician from Maryland, United States. Excellent. I'm Dr. Armand Ramim, I'm a medical physicist uh, here at uh, Vancouver, University of British Columbia and BC Cancer. Okay, well perhaps one of you might want to start with what's the problem? Um, what, we, what problems do we need to solve here? <laughs> I can start there, sure. and, and that's an enigma of the cancer. Yes. Cancer is meticulously difficult disease to address, and one of the very important challenges there is heterogeneity of the cancer, what wow. is cancer, and how to address that. So, without any doubt, personalization and precision approach to the cancer treatment is a way to go, and we know all that one does not fit all, at least in the case of cancer treatment. Right, and, and you're right, it's, it, cancer is totally heterogeneous, but it's heterogeneous in more than one way, right? Um, perhaps you talk about the different ways that cancer is heterogeneous, perhaps uh, different phenotypes of cancer, different shapes of cancer, different localizations, and in terms of the tracer, different off-target uh, bonding, right? Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the things in, in that context, if you, if you truly believe in that, and I think that's an obvious point, what is being stated here, the point is that um, sometimes when something appears to be a little bit too difficult to do, we tend to switch off and say, let's not do it then. And I think that's actually what's happening right now ah. in, in those symmetry. Right. It appears, it seems, that it is not the most straightforward thing to do, and therefore we're not doing it. And I, we're sort of excited that here at this uh, Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Energy meeting, there is increasing talk about, you know, the fact that it can be done, dosimetry can be done, uh, it should be done, uh, and it has been done. So, so, so we, we would love to talk more about this. So. Right. I guess what you're trying to say is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the better. Um, yes. Would that be a fair comment? So I can... I can um, complement what you mentioned about the differences and the sources of the heterogeneity. And I want to ask Dr. Morris to elaborate on the two sources of that heterogeneity. One is the patient itself. We are all very similar to each other and at the same time very different. Ignoring that difference is extremely dangerous thing to do. On the other hand, the cancer itself between people within people, and even within one region is very different. Yeah, and how so we can use the Theranostic paradigm for For instance, for we know from uh, the treatment of thyroid cancer with iodine-131 for many years that uh, uh, patients that receive similar doses of uh, injected iodine-131 or oral iodine-131 um, may not actually um, uh, have the same uptake in their tumors or their uh, healthy tissues. Um, and so 
there is a difference between uh, patient uh, to patient. Um, and also, uh, they're in the pharmacokinetics of the, of the radioisotopes and their, uh, and their ligands. Um, and the other thing that we have to consider is also the uh, different tumors within an individual patient. Um, and some of the other diseases that are more indolent and longer lasting, uh, individual tumors within a patient's disease may be different um, over time. And, uh, and so we may not actually uh, get the same amount of activity into uh, one of a patient's tumor that we get into another tumor. Um, and if they have multiple uh, throughout the body, then um, you know, we may be in a situation where if we don't know uh, clearly what we actually treated the patient with, then um, that's going to cause recurrence and, and eventual failure of our treatment. Yeah. It could be avoided. Right. And, and of course, you know, tumors can get radio resistant. So if you don't, yes. give, if you don't give the right amount of treatment first off, then you're increasing that risk of radio resistance. And it's not like thyroid cancer where, well, thyroid, the treating thyrotoxicosis, where really all of the all of the tracer goes to the target organ. Um, if you give a little bit too much, it's not going to matter too much. But, but in the case of alpha therapy, which is, you know, big bangs for bucks, it's a great, powerful uh, therapy, but it's also... That's the bad thing about it. It's a great, powerful therapy. If it goes to the wrong place, then then it's a great, powerful danger, right? Would that be fair, Colin? Exactly. And what you're really alluding to is the um, the real limitation that we have on uh, how much activity can we give to the patients. Because, of course, we want to give um, as much as we can to effectively eliminate their disease uh, as much as possible. Uh, but we don't want to hurt their healthy tissues. Correct. And so our real limitation on uh, how many times or how much activity we can administer to the patient is really the dose that we administer to their healthy tissues. And if I may also add, uh, Michael, I'll go on my first name mm -hmm. basis here. Sure. So just, to, <laughs> just to relax and call each other my first name here. So, friends, uh, so, so we had a great talk in this meeting uh, by, by Jean, Dr. Jean-Mathieu Beauregard, and he was sort of summarizing you know, what's been happening. And essentially, he, was, he made a brilliant or a very important point. He said, you know, right now, as we're injecting everybody the same uh, radioactivity, 200 milliliters, let's say, the range of actual doses delivered to patients is one order of magnitude. So we're injecting the same amount of radioactivity, but because of all these heterogeneities and differences, we're delivering a whole one order of magnitude exactly. differences in well, what we're getting from patients. Injected to our patient. dose does not equal uh, the delivered actual dose. delivered right. dose. And, and even I go ahead and add to that that even we should avoid using the term dose for injected activity. Uh, yeah, this is that something is Carlos it. keeps telling me. I, I used to keep saying, you know, this is how much dose we injected. He kept telling me, don't call it a dose. Call it ra injected radioactivity. So, he kept correcting me. Yeah, what's the dose so, in, yeah, in yeah. radiopharmaceutical therapy? So, well, activity is measured in units of Becquerel. That's amount of decay per second. Right. When we talk about dose, when we talk about absorbed dose, or about dose symmetry, we measure energy deposited per unit mass of the tissue. And that we call the one grade. We measure yes, dose yes. in grade. Now, as physicists, we are good at performing dose symmetry. So a question either for Dr. Bobak. Bobak. Dr. Bobak. Bobak. Bobak or Dr. Michael. Michael's. Bobak. Just Michael. <laughs> yeah. So we know how to do it. Because why are we not doing? Are you so, find any problems? Because I think we can. We have solutions for it. So I can I can uh, tell you how much I'm proposed by this fact. Because if any part of oncology treating cancer can be personalized, it is the paradigm of paranostic and nuclear medicine. Yeah. What other uh, systemic therapies can we measure? I. Just that's my question. Right. So, um, <laughs> so either we are just like when we are using personalized oncology or precision oncology, we are just like using that as a practical joke, or we mean a real. Well, we mean real maybe course. personalizing to a target, but not actually personalizing to a tumor. Maybe, and and not to the patient. Yeah. So again, the thing that I want to say is that 
we all know how much personalization and precision approach to cancer matter. We know how much differences are there. And we have the best capacity to see what we treat and treat what we see in the paradigm of Theranostic immediate medicine. And not only to see, but, but also quantify, to measure, exactly. right? right? And that is so, the thing that I yeah. want to ask my, uh, my physicist friends, that how we can learn yeah. as a physicians to not be afraid of uncertainty in measurement. Because right. whenever yeah. we measure something, there is some level of uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. But should it be just like completely paralyzing factor right. to us? To the extent that we would disregard uh, doing it, right? right? Yes. I mean, it yes, can sir. be done, or can it be done? And, and, and it becomes yeah. a chicken yeah. and egg problem. Because I always hear these comments of, when you show me that dosimetry works, I'll start implementing. But then we need dosimetry to show that it works. So we can in terms of patient response yeah, in terms of and personalization. Yeah. Oh, and so, so what things do you need to measure? So exactly. But then I also hear, <laughs> but no, performing the symmetry requires too much time. It's a lot of, like, we need to bring the patient too many times to the hospital. That's too much. Um, we don't have the specialized stuff. And, and we have solutions for all of them. We know that when you look at external beam radiation therapy, the patient comes to the hospital every day for I don't know how many weeks. But, uh, when we talk about taking time to perform segmentation with Armin, we talked a lot about AI and bringing more of these tools to aid in dosimetry. We, we can make it work. And we have technologists that are experienced that segmenting. To help. Oh, oh, absolutely. We, we can involve and, the and we can just like even develop a new position in the workflow. That is the role of imagination and, and, and being creative in care of these patients. These patients need attention. And attention means not limiting ourselves to arbitrary limitations that the system that, that we've set up in our, in our, in our minds, mind. right? We don't yeah, have yeah, the people yeah. trained to be to be clear. It's, it's it is you asked what we what do we measure? And so I guess um, you know yeah. our physicists can definitely help answer this question more clearly. But I think that the real difference, which most people um, I think get hung up on is that most of the times when we're using, uh, for instance, a SPECT CT or a SPECT mm -hmm. camera in the clinic, we're really just generating an image with that mm -hmm. uh, instrument. Right. When we're talking about dosimetry, we really need to carefully calibrate the image, the instrument, so that we can actually measure the activity in some kind of reliable way. Yep. And there may be some uncertainty, but I think that maybe some people get stuck because they may just not have uh, their instrument calibrated in the way that they need uh, in order to do the symmetry. But is that unnecessarily complicated? You know, just listening to you, it just occurred to me, we keep saying about diagnostics, treat what you see and see what you treat. It, it should be treat what you see and measure, and what see and measure what you treat. And we can do it. Again, example of AI, for example. AI can shorten scan durations. AI can automate the dosimetry workflows to reduce the burdensome aspect of it. Right, so so an AI can help us perhaps even build digital twins where we have these digital models of our patients that we can personalize uh, therapies for. It can it can it can help. And all those right? things would be awesome. Um, yeah. But the reality is, I mean, we're doing dosimetry every day uh, in our practice. So, now. Michael, I was having lunch with Michael today. I was shocked. He has a private practice. He is doing dosimetry routinely. Can yes. you tell? I mean, I was I was I was. Shocked, and I, so, I want. So I, I mean, want we. I mean, yeah. you know, why yeah. are you shocked? Uh, I mean, it, <laughs> yeah, why am I shocked? It, yeah, right, right. So right. I mean, you know, yeah. I, you're right. It's not, uh, you know, it's not uh, um, uh, the, you know, usual way that a nuclear medicine department uh, may be run today. Uh, but we think that it's really important for quality patient care, and we really want our patients that receive radiopharmaceutical therapy to have the best possible treatments. Um, I know that uh, you know some of those patients could potentially need additional treatments in the future, or uh, you know we're having new treatments coming uh, that are exciting all the time. Clinical trials are going like crazy right now, and so um, I feel that I can't ethically administer radioactivity to a patient without knowing uh, the dose that their healthy organs are getting, at least to some level of um, ability that we can that we can do and so, so you know we've calibrated our spect camera uh, with mm -hmm. the NEMA phantom uh, for each isotope that we use yes it took us an afternoon to do that 
Uh, now, but, you know... The Society of Nuclear Medicine, the American Society of Nuclear Medicine, has a standard on how to calibrate your cameras, yeah, right? Yeah. It has phantoms there, and it has a has an instruction manual how to right. do it. And, and what's more, it has a procedure guideline, not only so, so the American Society, but also the European Society. That's true. And many of the spec CTs uh, these days are uh, so well... Um, uh, you know, understood that you don't even need to perform a density correction. Although, if you have a CT that isn't well uh, documented in terms of its CT density, they have density phantoms that we can use to do a density correction on the CT as well to even better uh, perform attenuation correction from your spec CT images. Um, you know, if you have a combined spec CT, you can register those. But before we had that, you know what? We acquired CTs separately from our spec images yeah. and registered them manually ourselves. And I think that sometimes our registrations came out better than the hybrid right. spec CCs. So, uh, can, yeah, I, can I say something yeah. you guys yeah. tell me if you think I'm not correct or you can comment. I think we're just comparing our uncertainties to the wrong thing. Mm. I know external beam radiation therapy, mm. they're decades ahead of us doing those symmetry. They perform those symmetry, they say, okay, we have it's that dose, we have that dose, dose within, within one, two percent. Yeah. So then we come after our camera calibration, we do those symmetry radiopharmaceutical therapies, and we say, okay, right now maybe we're within 20, 30%, and everybody goes like, oh, well, that's so far away from 2%. Yeah, that's yeah. so yeah. far away. Well, of course, if we compare to 2%, we are super bad. So, but what's happening is that nowadays, we don't even have to see that our uncertainty is infinite because we don't even uh, do or it. Or one order of magnitude. And, yeah, so, and, and now if we bring it down to 20%, that's that's a big increase. Of, yeah, I, I, I want to just like add to what you said. Three very important points. First, when you are measuring something, I go to the history of medicine to elaborate on, on this matter. Imagine that's the beginning of the uh, evaluation of the cardiovascular system. I had a very, very talented uh, cardiovascular medicine mentor that always told me that how you measure the blood pressure? You put a cuff, an arm of a patient, in one of the vessels, measure it. It reflects, I don't know exactly what, but some measure of the physiology. Regardless of that fact, if you do that meticulously and every time the same way, it can provide you with a very important measure that can save lives. Absolutely. That's been proven time and, and time again. And, and if you want to be a perfectionist in the sense that the pressure that you measure in your brachial artery is not exactly the pressure that your aorta at whatever location it, it measured, yeah. then you are perplexed. Yeah. Perplex. You cannot even observe what, what happening. That is first. The second is that this um, fantasy of precision in external beam radiation dosimetry. There is a big difference between planning of a dose for treatment and actually delivering of that. Whatever we do in external beam radiation is dose planning. What actually happened, I'm going to give you a surprising news. It's very different than what we planned for. The thing in yeah, but if, even if it wasn't, I think the point is that you're I, still I, planning. Yeah, yeah. At, at least you're you're still planning, right? You're, but the right, problem is right, you're not right. taking into account patient motion during. Yeah. Yes. Of course. So I'm saying you I don't, don't know I, exactly I what to, tissues. Yes. So I, with imaging, you do know yeah. exactly where the radioactivity. So, so was I want to just like so say in some that ways you have increased certainty. Interesting. Absolutely. That is the point. I, I want to say that it's okay. not okay. even saying that oh we are as good. No, we're better. Unfortunately, it, it, that's a uh, very... At least the potential. <laughs> and so in our patients, they receive, uh, you know, radiopharmaceutical therapy, and they know from our pretreatment consultation that they're going to come back for uh, two days of uh, post-treatment scanning. And uh, none of our patients complain about that because I explained to them that that's very important for us to understand how much mm -hmm. dose their healthy tissues and their... Mm -hmm. tumor is received. Mm -hmm. And of course they want to know that information. In fact, I tell them, you know, imagine if you uh, went to get external beam radiation therapy right. and they said, we're just going to, you know, give you some radiation. We're not sure really exactly how much, uh, but hopefully it's going to help you. Uh, we would never do it that way, right? And so I think it's, 
it's very important for us to know a few things. One, even if we uh, don't have, uh, you know, if we have some level of uncertainty of the actual dose, at least we know that our treatment did what we expected it to do based on our pretreatment yeah. diagnostic scan, okay? That's an important thing. Two, we know the patient is excreting excess radioactivity appropriately. That's also very important to me for planning what their toxicities may be. I don't want a patient to uh, have vomiting or no. uh, um, other issues that could really complicate their radiation safety plan and, and all of these things. Um, also, uh, beyond that, I want to know um, as best as I can what dose their uh, critical organs receive, uh, such as the kidneys, for instance. Absolutely. Because if I have a patient that may have some decreased renal function or maybe uh, they have some other medical problems that affects their renal function, or uh, maybe their disease has a great benefit from the treatment, uh, but we don't quite get to a complete response, yeah. and they may need more. So you, you, How can we decide? It, it, you know, one of the things, I mean, Carlos, you're, you're actually in our own lab, we're sort of doing this investigation, and others are, that the fact that on average, on average, we're underdosing patients. We're making these measurements. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that the amount of dose delivered right now we're being too conservative, right? I mean, would you say that's I think, that's, that's I think in general, we know that we're underdosing patients because these therapies have been empirically, like set, like the 7.4 gigabecal of 200 milliculis are basically empirical evidence that we are not killing the majority of the patients we're under treating the patients. And, and we're doing them disservice by under treating them, right? I am. It's, it's suboptimal uh, therapy. Yeah. I mean, and I'm concerned about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in addition to all the things that uh, Michael mentioned about the aims of those symmetry, I can add to that. It's better to predict the failure sooner and find a measure to address it rather than let the time show us in a hard way. That's the and advantage of theranostics, right? Exactly. If we have uh, some therapy that we can't directly measure or image, then all we can do is let time pass and hope and cross our fingers and... Uh, you know, uh, follow the patient. And, and, and just like imagine who is paying the cost of that negligence. And that is the thing that really disturbs me. Because at the end of the day, all of the tools that we are using is for a reason, and that is caring of our patients. We should do whatever we can to minimize their pain and suffering or eliminate them. And it is imperative that we can predict to the level that you can. Yeah. It, I, I was in this meeting. Um, Mike Stabin is a pioneer in the field of uh, dosimetry, um, and he, he was disclosing to the public audience that he himself uh, was a cancer survivor. Uh, so there's a personal touch to it. And, and he had this statement that uh, he said, it is morally incumbent upon us to, to not be delivering suboptimal therapy. We need to be measuring what we're, what, how, how much we're, you know, we're delivering to our patient. It is, it is incumbent upon us to 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 not do essentially what we're doing right now, which is about. I mean, therapy. as a physician, yeah. I feel that my patients and all patients deserve the best possible quality care that we can provide. And if there's anything that we can do um, that is not, uh, in some ways, going to cause the patient potential harm, then I think that we should. Uh, and, and, and you get reimbursed for this too, right? In your practice? Like so when in, you're adding in the, the United States, there yeah. are, of course, uh, you know, billable codes for, um, for tumor imaging by spec CT and also an add-on code for dosimetry. Um, I've, different, uh, you know, policies in different countries may be different, but um, certainly, uh, you know, there's no problem with uh, having the patients uh, covered for these procedures. And even if uh, two time points are sometimes difficult to get coverage for for the patients, there are emerging modeling coming out that I know you guys have been working on some of this too that could make it possible to have some sort of measure, even if it's not as good as oh, simplified, time simplified protocols. Yeah, but, like, but, yeah. but, yeah. but I, right. I, I yeah. should just like uh, push the envelope a little here and say that we should not accept suboptimal care just 
for the reason that we cannot appropriate resources. It is on us as physicians to fight for our patients to the level that's possible and never ever let them down just because at the moment we resources are not available. That is my point. Yeah. We should fight for them because they trust us. And the moment that this trust erodes, then they lose everything. They do not come to us to receive necessarily a cure. They know they, they okay. cannot so, do that. So if, if, if better quality care becomes the standard of care, yes. then, <laughs> then, yeah. uh, well, then the there's an expectation that other people will have to reach that standard. That's obvious. So changing attitude is one thing. Okay, what are the other roadblocks? Is it training? Is it staff? Is it software? What? So single. Tell us. I mean, so well. Wait, let a, me just. Okay, I, yeah. I was just gonna say one more thing. I think. Yeah. Maybe the point that Armin was getting to about the reimbursement yeah. is more that if something, if a procedure is recognized and reimbursed, yes. and there's a, a billable, uh, you know, um, indication for that, then that means the procedure is standard of care. Whether or somebody can. Uh, can perform that at their facility may be different. I mean, maybe no. some people, not everybody may have a, a PET scanner. Maybe they need to do some, uh, you know, general uh, nuclear medicine scan for their myocardial perfusion, for instance. Uh, although we have uh, PET myocardial perfusion, um, but not everybody has the same equipment, maybe the same expertise at their institution, uh, you know, to do everything. But I don't think it's fair to say, if something is uh, is identified as something that is um, a reimbursable procedure, then that means that it is a, uh, a rational um, and, and standard procedure that uh, yeah. that is indicated. It's not going to yeah. get there. It's not going to be reimbursable unless it is. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, and, and that means it's well down the track. So, yeah. So, what comes next? What What, what are the roadblocks? Do technologists want to upskill? Do they want to be? Right. Do right. they want to consider their that they have a job progression? Do they want to consider that they can get better at their job? Well, uh, that's a, that's a, that obviously yeah, so, the answer is yes. So I right? think, I think I technologists think, can yeah, get involved yeah. more in the decision to work. So uh, Armand and I are our institution. We're starting to get them involved in helping us with calibration. So at least they understand why is that the setting that they have to do is in the activity meter is different when you have a vial and it's different when you have a a syringe, yes. which is the one that you're going to use when you inject the patient. Yes. Right. So they pay attention to which are we, we, which of those settings are they going to use. Now, our clinicians are busy. We as physicists are not very well trained in, in segmenting. I mean, we know the main organs, but, but technologies are great at that. Time. They're great at that. And we're getting them involved in into helping us with segmentation. This segmentation, of course, gets verified by our physicians before us physicists yeah. continue the rest of the calculation. And as we go forward, we are getting, we're improving our workflows. Our, our technologies are getting better at segmenting. We're having semi-automatic tools for it. We're having AI tools for it. And then it's becoming a test that instead of having to segment, they just very basically verify, and then it goes to the physician, and the physician does a double check. Oh, yeah. Well, in radiotherapy, you segment, exactly. don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And in the United States, in the United States, and, and many other countries, we have approved softwares that Absolutely. can that can make in these very, In this very meeting, we're starting yeah. to see softwares pop up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we one, had a we had a discussion this morning about all the different hands-on session with the yeah. software. And, and one one very important point that I I want to emphasize that is again another myth about the cost. We cannot imagine how much. It's costly not to do things <laughs> right from the, at yeah. the first time. Right. Yeah. We think that we are not expanding more by cutting the corners, but we pay that back with interest down the road. Yeah. That's true. I, and, had, I had a professor back in my undergrad. He used to say, doing things wrong or doing them right costs the same. I heard, you know, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Or, or, you know, um, my, my, I heard this expression from my mother-in-law often, often she says, I'm not so rich to buy cheap or something like that, right? So if, if you're kind of uh, not doing things the right way in the long term, mm -hmm. it's going to actually cost us more. Well, right? my, so I'm, I'm having my kitchen remodeled and, and, and the carpenter says, measure twice, cut once. 
That's right. <laughs> and that's what we do, right? We treat once, and then we measure at least twice if we can. <laughs> so, so um, I, I feel, um, I feel there are Absolutely many, right. many misconceptions um, in the field. More than anything else, more than the resources availability, more than the skills, more than the precision, more than all of the above, there is one problem, and that is the importance of Patient-centered care, right? Patient is that what you're going to say? Exactly. I knew you'd say that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think the Sorry, reality but, is... Because, well, because that's, that's ultimately the point, right? I think the reality is, you know, um, change is difficult for people. And uh, as this field is progressing, I think there's, there's a lot of new things coming all at once. And I think that, you know, we have a lot of departments that are used to doing things a certain way, and they haven't seen development at this speed, no. uh, you know, in the past yes. 10 or 20 years. And it can be tough to keep up. Um, but I think that we have to, uh, you know, for our patients, try to uh, to do what we can to, to push forward. Um, Isn't change just another word for opportunity? That is the point that I wanted to mention. And that is the point. I guess if that's we, why we started our practice. Exactly. That, that, is, the, that is the point. If, that, if others don't, somebody else will. You know, right. yes. the big institutions yes. can't change, the smaller, more nimble institutions will we'll do. will push the field forward, and that's what we're doing at, yeah. uh, and, at my institution. And that is inevitable. That's the point. That when the ambience, when the Uber came, the, 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 the taxi drivers yeah. could be uncomfortable at the beginning. It's better to move toward the right direction sooner. Otherwise, you will do that regretfully at the end with a mm -hmm. lot of losses. So the thing that I want to say is that if you stand on the right side of history and try to be innovative, try to have the best interest of the patient at heart, and in every time that you make a decision making, then you yeah. are doing something right. Create the resources you need. You know, exactly. If, if, if Find the vision is there, if, if we know that this is what needs to be done. And again, the resources are... Honestly, a lot of these resources are already here or almost here. For example, often there is this impression in people's minds that to do the symmetry, you need to do many, many time points, many, many measurements. Mm -hmm. Patient has to come back multiple days per cycle. No, there is, there is increasing evidence, and we're pretty convinced that simplified protocol, single time point dosimetry is possible. It's going to give us pretty good numbers. So why not do and utilize these simplified protocols and get some numbers like you're doing in your practice, mm -hmm. create the evidence. Or even two time forward. points. I mean, well, well, right, right, right. And if, exactly. and if we can, you know, for some things, uh, some of the more challenging situations, we may do more time points if yeah, we absolutely. can. But, um, but I think that, uh, you know, um, I think personally, one of the challenges for the field and one of the reasons why, you know, a, a lot of other people are frankly lagging behind is that. I think it's it's more than a technology problem or a resources problem or uh, you know um, understanding how we can do dosimetry problem. I think that it's kind of a culture shift in the department in a way. So you know our nuclear medicine departments, except for some of the iodine one thirty ones and these things, are are really uh, built around being primarily a uh, a diagnostic service oh, and um, not a therapeutic service. And and we are. We now need to have two separate lines of service. Really, uh, the, the therapeutic service is, you know, as time intensive or more in some situations to the diagnostic service. Those patients are can be complicated and require some thoughtful time and consideration, both in uh, clinical consultations, treatments, post-treatment consultations, radiation safety consultations, and uh, the dosimetry measurements and those imaging tests can be longer than some of the others. But you have to put all of those things together to have really a complete service for these patients and really deliver the best quality. So you're treating a patient, not a picture. Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and on top of that, I can add one more point. And what Dr. Morris mentioned is distinctive difference between resources and the ecosystem. You may have a lot of resources that are wastefully invested on a wrong cause in your department, which is a reality in many places. Right. 
it doesn't when when people say we don't have money in my mind i translate that i don't know how to invest them in an appropriate location distribution of resources is more of a problem than the resources in itself in majority of the cases and this is what the culture needs if in if there's a will there's a way yes right? yes so we're going to create that ecosystem if we want to create that ecosystem yeah. you need to appreciate the people who are trying to build such a thing you should I don't say again find resources distribute resources right. fairly well, perhaps there's a place for, for 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 more than just distributing it inside your practice but between practices for example you could share a calibrated dose standard that goes around to your dose calibrators which you can all share to to then make sure that your dose calibrator is giving the correct value right and um, against the national standards you can do the that's same one of our big limitations I must say is we need more traceable sources yes. for the dosimetry uh, that we're doing and, mm. and that is something that we really need to push industry um, to get involved in uh, because it is hard if you don't have a traceable dose which uh, or a traceable source which but, but a cases. traceable source can be shared amongst a right. number of, of different practices right. right right and 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 that's a way that you can yeah. um, uh, better use your resources and obviously that's where it begins if your dose calibrator doesn't read right then everything else yeah. is off right yeah. 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 and there's opportunities for training I mean as you suggested with the technologists I mean um, in our practice for instance uh, in our we do this every day so our technologists know that anytime we have a new therapy or even the same therapy in a different package you know we have to have a new setting uh, for that because geometry is important these things are all very, very important to having accurate clinical um, dose uh, prescription. And after looking at uh, Michael's practice, yeah. I'm convinced we have resources. We need the change of culture. We need the change of mentality and shift how we think about the practice. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we should make sure that we are advocating for our patient to bring more resources to improve whatever we already is possible to be done. Totally agree. I mean, I started by saying, and I really want to emphasize this, it, it, I just feel it very strongly. I feel the vibe in this meeting to dosimetry. It can be done. It should be done. And it is being done by some, right? So so we have the right tools, or we almost have the right tools. We, mm -hmm. have, it. we have the right tools, and we almost have better tools, right? So it can be done. We can do it. But I think the will has to be there. Yeah, we shouldn't. We certainly right. shouldn't stop improving. A absolutely. But right? we have tools to work with now, today. Yeah. And we, as, how, as your example. And we there. recognize yeah. that we have unknowns. But the only way of finding what those unknowns are is doing it and trying to fill in the gaps. Yeah. Yeah. Look at history. I mean, uh, I would encourage everybody to go back and, and look at the first X-ray or the first CT scan or the first. PET scan okay. and think about you know what that compares to the information that we can get from those type of things today so of course it's natural for things to start out uh, in some position and improve over time yeah. and we're going to keep doing that I and mean, that this conference uh, we heard um, you know Simon Cherry talk about imaging at the 26 picomolar and sorry 26 picosecond, picosecond right. uh, resolution uh, yeah. For time of flight yeah. to the point where you can have four millimeter uh, reconstruction less imaging, or yes, whatever, right? Four yeah. millimeter time of flight resolution. Yes. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, it's natural for the field to keep improving yeah. and yeah. pushing forward over time. And that's inspirational. But that shouldn't paralyze us from no. doing no. the best that we can do today. And, and that yeah. is the yeah. thing that, as a patient, if I'm a patient, and throughout the history, before modern era, we didn't have that much of a very effective treatment for many of the disorders. In order to trust your patient, if you're your physician, you wanted to make sure that person have your best interest in mind and is capable and has the knowledge to care about you. The treatment might not be effective or might be effective. That is secondary for the majority of the patients because we know as a human being the disorders and diseases are complicated and we are dealing with very complex situation the trust build when patients understand we are fighting for their well-being no matter what and we are standing 
on the side of life and their uh, best interests. Yeah, I, I'm honestly worried about some of these clinical trials that are going on, right? Because, you know, if you're going to have suboptimal, you know, design of clinical trials, and what if, you know, after a few years from now, suddenly you start seeing that the results are not so great? And let, let me be a little bit um, I mean, I'll just perhaps, tell you that yeah, most yeah, of the clinical yeah. trials that we're seeing today are including dosimetry in their trial design, at least in the earlier the good phases ones. of the good, the good ones. The good ones. The bad ones you don't see. Right, sure. Right. Yeah, but we just, I mean, I'll, I'll give you another example. We've just seen Adjuhelm run a clinical trial where they didn't do, uh, didn't do uh, the tau scans in, in the majority of places. We had other studies where they didn't do the measurements. They didn't check the data. And this has cost them dearly. Absolutely. Right, Absolutely. it's meant that they're going to have to go back and repeat it and do it again better. And so, if you don't measure those things to start with, then you risk the failure of a therapy that otherwise might work. Yeah, and and and, and applies in exactly the same way. There, there is one nuance to all of that, and that is sometimes the effect and efficacy of the treatment is to the level good that. When you even do suboptimal design, it looks, the like, therapy, are good it looks like it's just like better than something. And it is. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, is. Is. it is. But what we are depriving our patient from is the best thing that they can have. Right. Right. And that is my concern because our patients do not come to us to just like help them better than nothing. They come to us with the hope and expectation. Deliver the best possible, That's nothing right. less. Right. I think is it that hard to deliver the best possible? Well, I think that some of the work that uh, that these guys have been, I think some Very of the work question. that these guys have been working on. Uh, both I can say and that together. relatively easy, relatively easily, we can do better than what we're doing right now. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty strong point, and that's a strong argument. Um, so it's not to disregard that. I mean, there's so much excitement in this conference for you know, this new renaissance in nuclear medicine. But the point is, we're not saying there is not a renaissance. And we're saying this, this, we're just at the beginning. And we've seen this coming from many people. This is just the beginning. And this is a, actually a critical time for us to get it right and do it right. Otherwise, you know, I worry that if we don't do it optimally, we're going to see subpar findings as well. You know, instead of extending life by, by, by a year, we're, we might be expanding life by two months. Sure, there's something happening here, right? But but why 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 can't why shouldn't we be doing something that relatively easily it can be better than what we're doing right now? Right. And so and if your you know if your mother or your brother is part of one of those things, wouldn't you want your mother to, or brother to have the best uh, best treatment? That's possible? For, for me, that that's is the ethical standard. Patients. Absolutely. Yeah. That is for my, for me. That's my ethical standard. That yeah. Imagine that you are that patient. Yeah. Do you really want to receive the best possible yeah. or something that is relatively good? Right, right. And somebody just argue with you that, but you know, that is, that is what we can do right now. You say that, yeah. We can do better. Are, are, you, we can do are better. you kidding me? I mean, my life is at stake. I'm we are to, doing better. You are doing better, right? And, yeah. and, and the community as a whole can be doing better. Yeah. And are yeah. you happy to help other people do better as well? Sure, absolutely. I mean, the resources are all there for uh, for anybody. Um, you know, I think that uh, if they want to, to learn more about dosimetry, you know, they should definitely participate in the meetings. Um, the, the problem that always uh, Michael mentioned about these things, as he multiple times uh, uh, brought up, is the culture of larger institutes. It's yeah. very difficult to change them. The, I, the thing that I want to encourage our newly graduate yes. physicians is going out, having their own uh, practice, and trying to do the right thing for the patient. You don't need permission of the larger institutions. I think we're really in the age. Within, within institutions, I I'm think, hoping things can change, right? I, I mean, I'm sure, yeah. but I think we really are seeing the age of private practice nuclear medicine emerge today. I mean, hmm. it's just so much faster and more efficient. Um, and it can certainly be done in the community and especially, you know, because of all the things the world has been going through, I think more and more patients are seeking care in the community and looking for care. And that is the point. Right now, many of the patients see that they have two options, either going to the larger institutes, bigger name, 
but they are like a giants that cannot move as fast as possible and they may receive suboptimal care because of that cultural and mentality challenges or they can go to the practices that can deliver the best possible very nimble and in a very efficient way. Well, and I want to be also, optimistic. I'd like to, I want to be optimistic. I'd like to I want see to the larger institutions. <laughs> right, right, you know, I'd like right. to see the, yeah. the larger institutions with all the resources and all yeah. the science yeah. and yeah. all of the academics be able to get back to focusing on pushing the field forward. Yeah. And, and, and that is what you yeah. do is actually motivate them. Because yeah. that okay. makes them just like, oh, They shouldn't be an assembly line for patient They should care. be motivating you know, they should be uh, the, place the, where the field and forward. I, I, have time to think. I think there's great things sort of happening in the background. Again, having entered this meeting, you know, I was really curious to see what, what the vibe is going to be. I'm actually quite optimistic, like having come to this meeting, the kind of discussions that are happening, so many sessions just on dosimetry, hands-on dosimetry, all this stuff. So stuff is happening in the background, but, but I think the community just needs to come together to, to have these kind of conversations and, and move I, the field forward. I have yeah. this exactly the same thing. My hope is the next generation, the generation that come out of the med school going to the residency and try to be a better nuclear medicine physician than us. And the next generation of physicists. I and mean, the next generation of physicists. I think it's physicists. a super inspiring time for the field yeah. of nuclear medicine. And engineers right. and mathematicians yeah. and Everybody technologists should... and chemists. I mean, let's face it, with, you know, all of those things contribute to, to making uh, to symmetry. But what's more, it's... Uh, it means that you have greater job satisfaction. You're not just pumping out a picture to diagnose a disease. You're actually changing the outcome of the person. Right. Yes. Really and, <laughs> and, and that's the, all of these things are the things that makes us hopeful, and we are sure that the future is bright. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't care about what is now is there. We look at the potentials of the tomorrow, and that's definitely something exciting yeah. to go towards. And patients are also very optimistic. I mean, the patients that I see. Uh, you know, coming back, we follow these patients after we treat them, and they're um, uh, they're very very happy with uh, their radiopharmaceutical therapy and their dosimetry. Um, and uh, you know, um, in many for many patients, it's better tolerated than some of their past treatments. Right. Um, sure. And well, maybe the patients can drive this too. Josh Malman, who's a, who's a patient advocate, right? Yes. And a fabulous guy, right? He's been on the podcast, so. The, the patient advocates can actually um, prick our conscience to do a better job and move things forward. And even, I mean, in terms of getting dosimetry done, in terms of getting regulatory uh, things organised, I mean, let's face it, uh, the US was one of the last places in, in the Western world to get theranostics underway. Mm -hmm. so, and, and only by... Um, by people like the, the patient advocates, they really help push that through. And of course, the Society of Nuclear Medicine did that too, because right. when you work together, you get there better as well. So I don't think we're, and the Society of Nuclear Medicine is a big institution, isn't it? Absolutely. And, yeah. it's, and yet, it's, it's, we're here at the Society of Nuclear Medicine meeting, we're discussing this now, we're setting up training, we're doing talks. So just because it's a big institution doesn't mean it can't act in the patient interest. No, absolutely are right. And that is the importance of the community action. Uh, society of Nuclear Medicine uh, and Molecular Imaging is a professional society. It does not deliver the care itself. It's us. It we are, this is the people. Yeah. So, uh, and this is the voice of a wise part of the community, which are pushing for the better future. And, and that is something that we all acknowledge. The thing that is very exciting about um, the future, and as you mentioned, by more um, involvement of the patients and patient advocate, yeah. we can go a long way. Yeah. And patients, uh, you know, one of the things that we are working on actively right now uh, in Maryland, um, I think at the local level, but I hope to see, um, you know, the societies and uh, everybody working on this more um, at the national and international levels as well, to really um, educate patients on um, what nuclear medicine is and the different components of their care in nuclear medicine and what the dosimetry um, that they receive is so that they can also be informed when they're 
trying to decide uh, where they're going to go and who their yep, nuclear correct. medicine physician is going to be. Absolutely. And, and the other thing that I want to mention is the importance of mentorship. Yep. Because that is something that extremely changed the life of people. We uh, got trained together with the people who really cared about the patient. And we never thought that a nuclear medicine physician seeing a patient is a weird thing or an abnormal thing. Uh, contrary to that, <laughs> if anybody even pretended that you're, we are a physician, physician, yes, physician. yes exactly. <laughs> and our mentor always. Why? Why is this considered funny? I mean, it's no, no. It is. It is. It's the point that the, some of the some of the people because of uh, what uh, Michael mentioned. It's a culture. Uh, it's a, it's a training. Some of the change, things I was alluding which is, to. We have to we have to look at the history of nuclear medicine in in United States to better understand that. We should review the 2000 to 2020 the battles and everything around that. That's we, a different podcast. Yes, that's I a mean, different that's podcast. Sure. That's yeah. a definitely I a different podcast. I can just give you a small example yeah. that, you know, when we were in training, one of our uh, board review courses, uh, one of our mentors asked uh, the residents, you know, if a patient comes into your department for their thyroid scan, how often do you examine the thyroid? There's a very obvious answer to that yes. question. It's every time the yes. patient comes into your department. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, uh, you may include that in a note. <laughs> and this is not an unusual thing. In no, medicine. and that is the way that we practice medicine. Yeah. And that is the point. Mentorship is important. Your role models are important. How you get trained is how you practice. And it's like a parenting. If they teach you how to behave, you behave how they teach you to be. That's right. Yeah, but I think, and I've been saying it several times in this meeting, I think, like, I would motivate everybody to start doing those symmetry. Yeah. We would be able to find those those response relationships. We would be able to better set like that toxic levels for healthy organs. I think if we optimize that, we will optimize the healthcare resources. Because now we won't send patients to have a therapy that's not going to work. It's going to save us some money. We'll be able to target a better therapy. And yeah, and, yeah, and just hopefully we can do outcomes. better. We can do better. The resources are there. We can do better. And well, let's do better. Let's just get on and do it. Let's just get on. Is it yeah. a good place to end the podcast? I think. Uh, it is. It's a, it's a fantastic point. Yeah. Yeah. Let's I think we need it. to get towards precision medicine. We have all the tools. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. Well, Excellent. thanks, Robert. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you very much. So much. Thanks yeah. for thanks for being part of the podcast. What a great podcast with all all the people. It's fantastic. Thank you.